Top Med Talk. Hi, I'm Monty Mython, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, coming to you live from Anesthesia 2018. We are coming to you once again from the trade exhibition, is what I'm going to call it, because I can't remember the name of the connection zone center, center here. I'm here with co-host Desiree Chappell, who's also the, the lead anchor for the US for Top Med Talk, and Mike Grocott, who we've heard from before. And we just want to do a quick a reflection, Mike, as a, an add-in here, which we put on the program about perioperative medicine, where we stand with perioperative medicine, the, the journey from enhanced recovery, uh, in the UK we'll focus on first, to perioperative medicine. And I think you're credited with sort of suggesting that it, it, perioperative medicine is sort of enhanced recovery 3.0. I, I don't know if that was me, but I'm delighted to be credit with, credited with it. Um, I mean, it, it feels... Uh, well, I heard you say that. It. Maybe, maybe I come up with it and you said it. <laughs> but let's work. Must let's, run, let's, let's run with it. Let's run with that ball. The, the narrative to me feels more straightforward in the UK than perhaps in the US and elsewhere. Um, because I think we've, we felt like with the Enhanced Recovery Partnership Programme, so we had a national implementation of Enhanced Recovery... Yep. And, and we felt like we'd been through that journey. And then uh, the college picked up the Peroptive Medicine Ball in 2014, which uh, you led. Uh, and, uh, and it felt like the, the next logical step, uh, extending the scope of enhanced recovery. And, and, and I know different people's definitions of enhanced recovery vary, but extending that scope more broadly. Uh, and we've started talking about from the moment of contemplation of surgery through till full recovery. So, so Desiree, we've, we've often chatted about the fact that the term perioperative medicine in some places it implies the fact that it's got something to do with physician providers mm-hmm. using the M word, whereas I think that when we were talking about it, we thought that medicine is the art of medicine, which is not necessarily just done by physicians. So you're quite a fan of the perioperative care term, is that right? I am. I am. I think it's definitely more inclusive at least here in the United States. Um, I think that when people think of perioperative medicine, it, you, it's multidisciplinary for sure, but it definitely uh, can keep people uh, not feel so embracing from that. So. So, so, Mike, your current role at the Royal College of Anesthetists is you lead the perioperative medicine leadership group. Correct. correct yeah. With a great team of enthusiasts there. But you've, I think there's a new development on the horizon which might cheer Desiree up I, th- I think I think the <laughs> name will make Desiree happy so we have um so the trustees sort of governing body of the uh, Royal College of Anesthetists approved a plan to set up a centre for perioperative care uh, and that was quite deliberate um so we a, a centre as uh, in contrast to being a faculty so we weren't looking to set up something uh, that would ultimately become independent Uh, as many of the faculties do and perioperative care recognizing that not only is perioperative medicine uh, multi-specialty but it's also uh, it's multi-professional so uh, and that that was an important part of uh, the process because it uh, although based at the college and led by the college the intent is for this to be a multi-specialty multi-professional organization oh my gosh that's fantastic so, and That's how so cool. it, you're, you're pleased? I, yeah. I am. <laughs> yes. Do you want to join? No. Yes. Yeah, where do I sign up? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, how's that going to manifest itself, Mike? What are the next big steps for that? So, the plan. So, the uh, the detail plan has to still be signed off by the college trustees. But the uh, ambition is to launch next May at the Anesthesia 2019, so our big annual flagship meeting in uh, in the UK, uh, with a uh, probably a, a medical director. Uh, appointed by that time and a a multi-specialty board in place um, so that there will be folk with paid time to uh, pursue the uh, the agenda of driving perioperative initiatives in, within the United Kingdom and beyond and, and that's all about the usual types of things that colleges do around professional standards, guidelines, training, education, policy etc. When it comes to the, the guidelines for example, how, how are you Give us an idea what, what you're going to produce guidelines on. So the uh, issues that are familiar favourites on Top Med Talk. Oh, I there think we go. Yeah. So, so, so 300 um, of them then. The <laughs> <laughs> not 300 of them, but I mean, I think is- issues around perioperative medicine where, uh, where actually quite often there aren't current guidelines or, the, or they need updating. But so, you know, for example, shared decision making. Uh, we're actually involved in some guidelines around prehabilitation for cancer at the moment, and that would logically follow through into some 
uh, closely related prehabilitation for surgery, um, anemia management, diabetes management, post-operative care, all, all, all the usual suspects. Because when it comes down to it, most of the hard yards are actually physically delivered by non-physician providers. Absolutely. I mean, there might be the... Well, like this, we had discussions like this recently. There might be the coaches on the pitch, but the team players are normally what we sometimes call allied health professionals. Uh, or uh, allied health professionals, specialist nurses, junior doctors. I mean, a, a whole host of people, but typically not the anaesthetist or the surgeon. So, and in the structure of the Centre for Perioperative Care in the future, I, I assume that that means there's absolutely no reason at all why the a director or whatever the title person is in the future could be a non-physician. Agreed. It doesn't have to be a anaesthetist and it doesn't have to be uh, a physician. Well, that is great news, isn't it? That is. It's It's absolutely fantastic. So what's happening in the USA on that front, Desiree? I think there are several organizations that are um, trying to drive that multidisciplinary approach uh, beyond physician-led initiatives. Um, The American Society for Enhanced Recovery is one of those. I've been involved um, with that organization. We've talked a lot about and been at those meetings. Um, and there's evidence-based perioperative medicine, which obviously we're um, associated with. The ASA and the perioperative the surgical ASA home. The ASA is perioperative surgical home. That's right. Um, and so I think people are recogn- finally providers uh, and the healthcare system is recognizing the need for the collaborative approach to care, and that if we need it, then we need to be able to. F- our organizations, professional organizations, need to help facilitate those things. Because when we do go to those multi, to truly multidisciplinary meetings, one of the things you often come away with and chat about over a coffee or in the bar afterwards, is that as opposed to an association of anology of some mm-hmm. form, it feels as though what we're lacking is a sort of an association of interested healthcare providers. Yeah. So we go off into our little silos yeah. and chat about things and have our own endeavours, but if we just joined up all the energy and the effort, which is what I think the centre in the UK aspires to do, that would be great. And it, it was interesting in, uh, so Dingle, uh, on the west coast of Ireland, another of the EBPOM meetings, uh, Ross Kerridge was talking about the Australian uh, experience and direction, and they're very much going the same sort of way as the Royal College of Anesis. So I'm not sure they've got a name for it yet, but they're looking to set up an entity within the Australian uh, society that would, would have similar aims. And, and the training and edu- much of the training and education is already joined up, isn't it? So if we take, sorry to plug it, but the UCL Masters Programme, for mm-hmm. example, supported by the Royal College of Anesis, there's no professional bar to doing that master so you can become a master of perioperative medicine from any healthcare background yep Yep. any 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 professional background so and the MOOC the massive open online course is taken by people from all backgrounds professional backgrounds and now we're starting to see fellowships emerge Mm -hmm. and there's no reason obviously the fellowships will be adapted to a certain extent from a professional background where the provider came from but the core materials are all going to be the same one i mean i would hope that they i would hope that they are we all need to be reading from the same manual um i mean we all have our special areas of specialty and expertise that we bring to the table and have a great background of that but we all need to make sure that we're because if you're an anesthesia provider that doesn't come from a physician background you come from a nursing background or an alternative science Mm -hmm. graduate background for example yep you, you don't you don't give the drugs differently or put the tube in no. a different way, do you? No. Uh, so no. there's no, no reason for all of that not to happen. So do you have any more questions on that, Desiree, before I ask Mike about the international board? No, uh, no, I just applaud you all for taking that initiative to do that, and hopefully we can follow suit in there in the U.S. <laughs> so so the, like, I think later on this morning, well, about 40 minutes or so, actually, there, there was another meeting of the international board of perioperative medicine. How, how's that all going? Really well, I think. I mean, I, I, I think correctly this is the first meeting of the International Board because we've previously met, um, you, know, you and I and, and, and many others, as the um, International Perioperative Medicine Curriculum group, Advisory yeah. Group or, or uh, some such terminology. Um, but I think there's, there's, there very much has felt over the last 12 months a momentum to form a board that would probably have a broader ambition. Uh, and, and that should be happening in, as you say, in about 40 minutes' time. And the aim there is to relatively light touch is to join up the thinking around the world such that as we develop learning materials curricula training programs that there's harmonization which means if you move from one country to another you practice perioperative medicine perioperative care 
trained to a similar level and in a similar way is that that's part of it that, 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 that's how I see it I mean, I, I mean in many ways the curriculum defines what the what the area of interest is so yep. so it, it actually seems a very reasonable place to start defining a common curriculum across the masters and various other professional qualifications in, in order to explicitly state what what is perioperative medicine but it's also mindful of the fact that the way and the style of the delivery of perioperative medicine might be quite different in the united states of america compared to south africa for example or other countries around the world it's all the core principles are the same but there is going to be nuances to that undoubtedly because of the different professional roles i mean as we as we see with for example critical care in the united states where you have respiratory therapists as i understand it predominantly driving the ventilators so so but at the bottom of it ventilating patients is still the same thing and in choosing if it plays out the way that it becomes the international board of perioperative medicine with a m it mustn't be interpreted that it's all about the physicians again it's Agreed. like it's like Agreed. the royal college Regis endeavor for perioperative medicine it, it's all about caring for the patient mm-hmm. and who does the caring is not the point uh, i completely agree great stuff i i, I agree <laughs> no, I do. I, no, I think it's. I think it's great. I, I think any initiative that we're doing, trying to move the needle on, that's Fantastic. the right thing to do. A- any other reflections? Because we should we close this little session because we've got another one we coming do. up at a moment. Any, and we need to get this Marshall amp draw done. Any other Are reflections sure I can't before take we? It home? <laughs> <laughs> you, have you subscribed to Top Metal? <laughs> No, I haven't yet. <laughs> you're, you're, li- you're limiting your chances then. I couldn't this time, but I did put my wife's name down. <laughs> well, so I figure, figure I might win by default. <laughs> you, you never know. You never know. You never know. So, and um, like any other fractions before we close this thing? I find it in- interesting that the so certainly in the UK that feels as a little bit of a quickening of the pace, but it actually seems to be reflecting what is going on globally. For whatever reason, we've been talking about it for a few years, and and. Uh, a number of things seem to have started to move forward at a, a reasonably similar time. Yeah, every, every meeting, and maybe I'm getting invited to the meetings to, to, to talk about perioperative medicine, and therefore I feel as though everyone's talking about perioperative <laughs> medicine, so that's a biased selection thing. But I'm sure they're both the same as you go around the country, go around the world. You get the impression that everyone's getting on the same page? Yeah. 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 And all the sort of journals seem to be changing their language and have perioperative medicine subsections mm-hmm. and getting into strap lines. What are we going to do with EdPom then? We're going to have to move on. Let's call it something different. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20 years in, that's usually the tipping point. There you it? go. Yeah. <laughs> it's based where it's based. Well, look, thank you very much indeed for sitting sitting down with us again, Mike. Um, Desiree, thanks for all your hard work. I know you've got uh, uh, a couple couple more interviews to go before we close One. that in. One. You're looking excited about coming <laughs> to the end. It's been, how many have you done in total now here? Have you got any uh, idea? About 15, I think. 15. Well, well done, you. And well done. Thanks for having thanks, me on the Thanks program. again to <laughs> everyone you, who's Mike. contributed. Thank yes. you very much indeed to the ASA for allowing us to be here with this wonderful, wonderful meeting, probably the largest gathering of anesthesia providers in the world. And a really big thank you to Smith's Medical for their continued support, but to making this space available with an unrestricted fashion. You know, we have not here discussing products. We're here discussing things like perioperative care, which is fantastic. So please do subscribe to Top Med Talk. You may, if you get in the next few minutes, be able to win this wonderful little Marshall uh, mini app that we're all craving. And there's at least two of us on up here who can't win it, I don't think, <laughs> because we were foolish enough to subscribe to Top Med Talk about a year ago. But, but it looks like Mike's wife is still in the game. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the game. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, if you're listening, Danny, uh, that was Mike. Um, <laughs> Well, thanks very much for listening, everyone. We'll be back soon. Cheers. Top Mid Talk.